Welcome to the show, everybody. Thanks for joining me tonight here on Off Limits. Tonight we're doing the Brain Purge show, so I appreciate you listening. If you're listening live, thank you. If you're in the chat room, thanks for chatting and for joining the show tonight. And for those of you who may just be listening for the first time, you can always check me out at offlimitshow.com. You can check me out also on spreaker.com. Um, and Twitter. Also, uh, the podcast is um, available on iTunes. If you want to subscribe to my podcast there, feel free. Also, follow me on Twitter, Off Limit Show, as well as on um, as well as on Facebook at Off Limits R A D as for radio, Off Limits Rad, basically. Uh, so, um, just wanted to talk about a few things tonight going on with me and also things just happening in the world at large, uh, nothing particular on my mind beyond the things I've already started to talk about tonight. So if you want to chime in, feel free to join the chat at Spreaker.com or on OffLimitsShow.com on the main page. You can chat there as well. And hey, darling, Nikki, thanks for joining me tonight. I appreciate it there in the chat. Thank you for joining me. It's good to hear your voice earlier. I haven't heard your show in a while, so it's good to hear you and David on the show earlier talking about TLC, the TLC movie, which actually I was going to discuss tonight as well, a little bit, just anyway. Um, so the, the people from the 90s, like me, which was my heyday, <laughs> which was the days, you know, that I look back on with great fondness because um, those are the days I was growing up and going to uh, going to um, college and uh, you know high school and college and you know the best days of your life really I think are those days of most people's lives and for me um, TLC represents that whole period because they were around that whole time and in the nineties and uh, and beyond actually and. So when the movie, I, I was watching Wendy Williams about a week ago and I heard the movie was coming on and I was like, oh my God, I've got to record it. So I immediately set my TV to record it so I wouldn't forget. And I watched it last night. I actually, last night I was exhausted. I'll tell you why in a minute, but I was uh, really exhausted last night and I was um, just ready to get to sleep, but I was so excited to see this movie and it's a biopic about uh, the group TLC and their journey from, you know, obscurity to stardom. And um, what they had to go through individually, personally, as well as professionally. And, um, but I, I just had to see the story. So I stayed up and I watched it. And um, uh, from like two to like 3.30 or whatever, it was like two and a half hours long, you know, with commercials, I skipped those. But anyway, uh, so it was really good. And I was really, I really, really enjoyed it. And, you know, there's lots of things that happened that I didn't know about, wasn't aware of with that group. And for most people, um, they don't know or realize that they are the number one best selling girl group in history, not just for R and B, but in history, even more than the Supremes, even more than destiny's child. Um, uh, I don't know what's that country group, you know, the Dixie chicks, whatever. I mean, all of these people are, cannot touch the number of albums and the number of sales that these people have made TLC um, is an incredible group. And the reason I think they were so successful and are still successful, but you know, we're so successful in the nineties, especially was because they were a combination of, you know, hip hop rap and sort of pop. And it was all kind of coming together because these three disparate women with disparate personalities came to form this one group. And, um, it melodically worked so well. Uh, and also their, their writing that they wrote the most of the songs that they sang. And it was just really an amazing thing. And so they were like number one in America, uh, the number one albums, you know, from the, from the get go and the number one songs and people loved them, all races, all kinds of people, they were everywhere. And from the beginning, they were selling millions of records, right? Well, they were managed by Pebbles uh, and L.A. Reid, whom were both married. And uh, Pebbles, knowing that they were neophytes and didn't really know anything about the music industry, took advantage of them and had them sign contracts that were very, you know, you know, um, one-sided. So uh, these girls signed these contracts, and they ended up getting. They were selling millions of copies of records. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. Millions of copies of records. Oh my gosh. I don't know what's wrong with me. Hold on. <clears throat> I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Millions of copies of these records and they were getting $25 a week a stipend, $25 a week in stipend. And, um, 
they kept asking about their contract and kept asking Pebbles about it. Every time that they asked her, she was indignant and said, how dare you question me? And, oh, my God, I'm your sister, and blah, blah, blah. And I would never do that. But she would never let them see their, their contract. So finally, they had to go to their attorney, which was also Pebbles' attorney, which is really a conflict of interest, and actually get to read their contracts. And once they did, eventually, they realized it was very one-sided. And so ultimately, they ended up <clears throat> leaving them buying their name back for $1 million a letter, which is not in the movie, but it was actually something they said on the Wendy Williams show after they filed for bankruptcy <clears throat> so that they could form reform TLC as their own group and, and actually own their name and their brand and, you know, and their record proceeds. Uh, they had to buy LA Reed made them buy back their name for $1 million a letter. So, um, <clears throat> oh my gosh, I'm going to have to play something and come right back. I'm so sorry. I'm having an issue here. I don't know what my deal is today. Um, let me see here. What's the, <laughs> what's the cl- fastest song I can play? I'm so sorry. Um, oh wait, can you hear me? <laughs> sorry. Sorry. I forgot to turn my mic off before I walked away. I'm sorry. And I was having an issue. Like I kept swallowing and I couldn't <clears throat> like, I couldn't like, I don't know what the fucking deal is. Anyway, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, I don't know why the music wasn't playing. That's weird. It's playing on my headphones, but you can't hear it. Hmm. Oh, I bet you can hear it now, right? Yeah. Sorry. (laughs) That's what happens when I, uh, I fuck up. Sorry about that. Anyway, back to the story. So what I was saying was, so yeah, so they ended up buying back their name for $1 million a letter, which is what LA Reed made them pay for their name, which is so fucking, fucking mean. I mean, come on. The guy was an asshole and so was his wife Pebbles. And uh, they just took advantage of them the whole time. Plus they were going through these personal problems where <clears throat> left eye had major issues with not only her own issues with setting what's his face's house on fire, uh, but also um, kind of, getting too big for her britches and thinking she should go solo and failing at that and having her own problems. And then, I mean, and what's her face having her issues with sickle cell anemia and the other one having her boy issues with uh, Dallas Austin. So, I mean, it really was a crazy, crazy life. These people had to live <clears throat> and they all seem really, <clears throat> excuse me. They all seem really like good people, good natured. And they all came from, you know, lower income households or whatever and had this major shot, at stardom and they really, really made it. And anyway, ultimately, obviously they ended up making money finally and, and all that good stuff. But after two successful albums where they should have, they essentially were robbed of probably over a hundred million dollars essentially by LA Reed and Pebbles. And so as my friend David was saying today with his friend, with his cousin, actually darling Nikki on their show today, the five by five talking about TLC, um, mentioned that, Today on on Twitter, there was a huge, huge backlash toward Pebbles because of her involvement and how she treated this group and how she took advantage of them, etc. I mean, honestly, the woman is a total cunt. So, I I mean, and this is to say that the things they're saying are true. And and the reactions that Pebble has has given and had leads most of us to believe that these things are very true. So anyway, that was the TLC thing. But it was a really great movie. It was good to see... Um, you know, their story and it's an interesting story and their music is timeless. It's amazing. It's wonderful. I love it. It's fantastic. And I can't tell you how incredible, um, their music makes me feel. I mean, waterfalls and God, there's so many, all their songs are so fucking good. I mean, it's like, they you know, they just came out with a 20th, uh, anniversary or whatever compilation of their best hits or whatever. And that actually is filled with all of their hits and you can just listen to it back song after song after song back to back to back and not be bored or have to skip ahead okay that's how good their music is it's so amazingly good so anyway uh five by five says girl are no longer referred to women as gold diggers but pebble oh yeah (laughs) five by five says that there's somebody had said that their girls are no longer referred to there's some guy on twitter or something i think he said said he's no longer going to refer to girls as gold diggers, but as pebbles because she was a fucking gold digger. <clears throat> anyway, so, <clears throat> excuse me, getting back to what I was going to talk about a minute ago. Um, so, 
I don't know if those of you who know me know that I've been uh, working on my house for a while and I've been building an addition and, um, my house is my project. It's, you know, I'm, you know, an architect, interior designer, and a realtor. Those are the things I do. And it is my, my laboratory. It's my project. It's something I love to do. It's an expression of what I you think architecturally, et cetera, it's going to be when it's finished. But anyway, so phase, there's three phases. Phase one was to do the addition, which is an 800 square foot addition, uh, for, well, actually it's, eh, it's bigger than that. It's, it's like more like a thousand square feet, including, cause part of it's included and that is the master bathroom expansion. But anyway, my mom's portion is 800 square foot addition that I built for my mother who was retiring. And, um, I wanted her to be able to live with me and her old age. And as she gets older and I can take care of her and she doesn't have to worry about, you know, anything at all in the future because she's worked her entire life. She's, uh, worked her entire life. I mean, really since she was a kid, she's worked. And so since she was like at least 15, 16 years old. And, um, so I just, you know, I want her to be able to, to relax in her old age. And so that's why I did that for her. So, so anyway, over this past few weeks, I've been really extremely busy trying to finish that for file inspections and that sort of stuff and trying to, um, get it ready for her to move in. And, uh, so, um, one of the things that I had to do was plumbing. And, and so I was actually, uh, trying to save about a thousand dollars almost, uh, in plumber fees to simply hook up, you know, the shower, install the toilet and, uh, install the sink vanity and install the, the kitchen stuff, right? Like the garbage disposal, dishwasher and the sink. <clears throat> so that was going to cost me about a thousand dollars. So I said, well, fuck that. We can do that. I mean, Michael and I can do that. Right. So <clears throat> we, we t attempted to do it ourselves <laughs> and um michael was at work one day he works one late day every week and i had to um i was here by myself and i was trying to finish it before inspection and so i had i tried to do it on my own and so i cut open one of the pipes like a fucking moron without turning the fucking water off and forgetting to do that and so when I did it, the water started gushing out towards me like a fucking, I don't know, geyser, okay, out of the goddamn wall under the sink, shooting across the bathroom all the way over to the toilet on the other side of the room and soaking the whole entire floor in the bathroom. And between the bathroom and her bedroom, I was going to put a pocket door, but I hadn't installed that yet. So it was just wide open. And so it just, it went right in from the bathroom, right into her bedroom on the hard, new, brand new hardwood floors. And, um, it was going everywhere and I didn't know where the fuck to turn the water off. I didn't know. I knew it was somewhere in the front. I thought, so I ran out to the front and I was like, Oh my God, Oh my God. I was freaking out. I ran out to the front and I turned the water off. I thought at one of these, one of the things in the ground and I, I turned this little knob thing in the ground, went back in there. It was still going, went back out there, went to this other one and found it, turned it off. Anyway, by the time I got back in there, it was like, a fucking lake. Okay. It was a lake. And so I was fucking, you know, crazy livid. So I was like almost crying. I was like, Oh my God. Oh my God. So anyway, I was just so devastated. And so <clears throat> while I was doing all this, I tried to call Michael to see where the front, where the uh, turnoff thing was. Um, and so I was using my iPhone and I was, while I was doing that, I was like taking this big bucket I had and trying to guide the water into the bucket. So it wouldn't go all over the floor. And then throwing the bucket of water into the shower, <clears throat> excuse me. And, um, instead, uh, when I did that one time, my, my iPhone fell into the bucket of water and was drowned in the water <clears throat> for about five seconds, pulled it out, put it aside, of course, and then continued to deal with the water issue. So it took me forever, like an hour or whatever to clean up everything. And the what the floor of course was soaked in the hardwoods in her bedroom and they were like slightly warped. And I mean, just, it was just a horrible mess. And I was so devastated because I wanted everything to be perfect for her when she moved in. And, um, so what was I going to say? Oh, and so after all that happened, whatever, um, I ended up hiring a plumber anyway to do it, finish everything. Cause obviously I was too stupid to turn the water off in the first place. And I didn't do it. I didn't have him do everything. I had to do the major stuff like the plumbing, like, you know, pipes and shit. And so, um, uh, he came, uh, a couple days later and this is the story about this guy. I'm going to get to that in a minute. But, uh, so before I get to that though, 
my iPhone was completely ruined. Um, I, it would turn on, but it wouldn't get a signal. Like you couldn't get a cell signal or anything like that. It was completely fucking ruined. And so I was like, fuck, 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 fuck. So that was down the drain. It was an iPhone five. And so I immediately uh, went and ordered an iPhone five S cause that was what was available. And it came today in the mail. So I went like for, for four or five days without a phone. It is fucking amazing how much we depend on our cell phones today. Okay. I mean, I know when I was a kid, you know, when I'm a kid, like a teenager, I had a cell phone and it was a luxury and very few people had them. I was like 19. I, I wanted to have a cell phone because it was convenient. So I had one and it was prime co, which isn't even around anymore. But, um, I, I had a cell phone and I know it was like a big novelty then. And now the days it's ubiquitous and everybody has a fucking cell phone. You live on your cell phone. It's not only a cell phone these days, it's a smartphone, it's a computer, you know, it's a calendar, it's a email, it's everything. It's the internet. And so I, you know, had several meetings this past week with clients and I had, couldn't go with, I couldn't, I didn't have my cell phone with me. It was just like fucking crazy. So it's really amazing how much you depend on a cell phone when you don't have one and how much you fucking miss it. And I had my iPad, but carrying that big ass thing around, you know, to do things you do with a phone was very difficult. So you can't make phone calls on it. Well, I actually did make a few phone calls on it using my, uh, using uh, Google voice numbers and, uh, some other things. So Oh yeah. And David, I told David about it when it happened and he's reminding me that I did stick my phone in rice and, I, and some Aborio rice <laughs> that I had and a container of it for like a day. And they say to do that if your phone gets wet and it'll suck the, suck the water out, I did that, but it did not work. So anyway, the good news is I got a reduced um, rate on my phone. I didn't have to pay the full like six ninety nine or $700 cost for the new iPhone because they said I qualified for a partial discounted rate, even though my contract wasn't up yet for whatever reason. I don't know why, but I did. So I had to pay like four ninety or something for it, the phone. And above and beyond that, I found these sites where you can sell your iPhone online, um, even damaged. And my damaged one came up to be about 130 bucks. And I was going to send it in there until today. The I thought maybe I could get more money on eBay. And so I put it on eBay and told everybody what happened, what was wrong with the phone, da, 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 da. and it sold in like five minutes for $199. So I essentially paid for half my phone by selling my old phone that's damaged, which they're aware of, um, for someone who thinks they can fix it. So I'm so happy. So I'm glad, I'm glad that I got some, some, some money out of that. So anyway, uh, the, um, What's the next thing I was going to say? Fuck. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Oh, so yeah, that's the thing about the iPhone thing. So anywho, back to the story about the, the plumber, I was going to tell you, this is the weirdest thing. Okay. Okay. This plumber comes and he's a real nice guy, older, probably like late fifties. Right. And he, he's a plumber and an electrician. Okay. Which is odd, but he's both. And, um, so he comes in and he does all the plumbing, whatever the first day. And then he starts doing that. It takes him three days, by the way, to do everything. All he had to do was to hook up the, and actually beyond that, we hooked up the garbage disposal. We hooked up the pipes and everything under the sinks. We just didn't put anything in the wall, the connections, you know? So all we had, all he had to do was make the connections we thought. And instead he actually ran into some issues he had of his own. Anyway, so it took him three days to do something. It should have taken him on a day to do. But he did a really great job. He did an amazingly good job, right? Okay. So this whole time he's talking to us, you know, as we're working through the, through the, the addition and stuff, getting it ready for my mother. And um, he's talking, telling us about his life and everything else. So he tells us that he does this for fun. He does his, his job with plumbing and handyman stuff, whatever, electrical, whatever, for fun. He likes doing it. That's why he does it. Not for the money, he says. I'm like, oh, okay. You know, I don't think much about it, right? And then, so, um, and he talks a lot. Okay. He talks a lot. Have you ever like gotten stuck in a conversation with someone who won't shut the fuck up? Okay. That's what this guy was like. <laughs> he was a nice guy, but when he started talking to you, when he caught your eye, you're like, you don't want to look at him in the eye. Cause you don't want to catch him in a conversation. You know, he would sit there like literally at one point in the last night when I was already exhausted, my mom was moving in last night. He was finishing up the electrical stuff and literally he was sitting there he was standing there at one of the light switches fixing it and he was turned around and started talking to me about his life and everything and i was sitting standing there for 35 minutes 35 minutes and the only reason he stopped talking is my mom finally came in and 
And uh, so I was like, oh my God, shut the fuck up in my head. But he wouldn't stop talking. And so, I mean, it's not like I wasn't interested necessarily, but I was busy, right? And so he kept talking and talking and talking. Anyway, I'm getting to the point here in a minute. So he tells us, um, my mom's there, whatever, early in the day. She was been, she'd been there before that point. But anyway, she'd been there early in the day. And uh, when she first came in, when the movers were coming in to move her stuff in to the addition. And um, I call it a guest house. But anyway, um, and she um, um, came in and was talking. And he brings, to, on the third day, he brings this little packet of information to me. And in it is about, I don't know, about 10 pages and double-sided. And there are all of these photographs of this house. <clears throat> and I've got it here. Hold on. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this is what it says on it. Well, first of all, he says, he says, hey, aren't you, he said, aren't you, um, he said, you're not just an architect, but you're also a, a realtor, right? Because he said, Michael was telling me you're also a realtor. I was like, yes, I am. And he said, oh, great. Because he said, I have a house that I think I'd like you to list for me. I said, okay, sure. I'd be happy to list your house, you know, whatever. And I'm thinking, you know, it's probably some, you know, rinky dink house, whatever, but I don't care. And so I don't even do real estate for really the money. I just do it because I like real estate. But anyway, so he hands me this little packet I have in my hand right now. And it has all these pictures, this man, this mansion. It's this huge house. And on it, it says his name. And it says sales price, $3.2 million. Owner financing available. I'm like, wait. I said, this is your house? He's like, yeah. I said, so this mansion is your house. He's like, yeah, this is my house. We built it about 12 years ago. I'm like, okay. And I'm like thinking something does not compute to me. I'm like, why is this person who owns a $3.2 million house working as a handyman? And you know, why is it doesn't make sense to me? I was thinking that in my head, but I was like, okay. And so I was taking my face value, whatever. And the other thing I should mention, I didn't mention earlier is, you know, how most handymen and people who are in like a blue collar job, they don't. They sound blue collar. There's nothing wrong with blue collar. My mother was a blue collar worker, and my dad's a blue, is a blue collar worker, and so it's nothing wrong with it. But I'm. I do. I sound like a blue collar worker to you? No, because I'm not. I wasn't raised to be one. I was raised. I was educated. Blah blah blah. So I don't have to be a blue collar worker. So blue collar workers typically sound more blue collar, meaning they have more. Um, um, what's the word? More. Uh, more more regional dialectal tones to their voices or whatever, you know, and they're going to sound a little more country down here in Texas. They're going to sound more like this, you know, how are you? I'll get that fixed up for you. You know, that kind of thing. So they're going to sound like that here. That's how most blue collar workers sound here. There's nothing wrong with it. I'm just saying that's how most of them sound. And whereas a person who has is, is a white collar worker typically sounds more like I do. Okay. So this guy has, he sounded very white collar. He, and I noticed this when I first talked to him and met him and he came in as a plumber, right? And a plumber and electrician. I'm like, okay. And I thought he sounded really educated, whatever. So I, so when he told me he had a $3.2 million house, I didn't exactly, you know, I was like, okay, so you, I said, maybe he's telling me the truth. Cause I could tell he didn't sound like a, you know, plumber or whatever. So he tells me this whole story about how he sold all this stock or whatever. He used to work for AT&T as an engineer and he sold his stock. Uh, they bought his stock out years back, whatever. And then he um, run all these programs for all these different companies. I can't remember what companies he named, all these big companies. And and uh, Nokia being one of them, not Nokia, Nortel being one of them or whatever. And so I was like, okay, great, you know. And um, so that's how he made his money. And so I'm like, okay, fine. So I'm like, fine, buying whatever. I said, sure. He wants me to sell him this house, this house for him. Sure, fine, no problem. Well, so if I were to sell this house for him, I would make a $3.2 million house. I'd make about $150,000 in commission. Okay. So it's not exactly just something I would turn my nose up at. Right. The thing is it's in Fort Worth and not in Dallas, which is like 40 minutes away. But anyway, it would be worth it. Right. Okay. So I, we go on with about the day he finishes. He does a great job. Ask him how much he wants me to pay him. Uh, how much do I, I said, how much do I owe you? He said, well, how much do you think it was worth? I go, I don't know. I said, just tell me how much to pay you and I'll pay you because <laughs> I don't want to haggle. And so I was like, just tell me what I owe you basically. And he's like, okay. And so, well, this is, these are my expenses. And he had to pull out this little notebook and he shows me what his expenses were and his gas and you know, this parts he had to buy and everything else. And he adds it all up. And he says, this is the, you know, this is what I spent in parts and everything else. It was like 200 bucks. Okay. I was like, okay. And I said, so how much do you want above and beyond the 200 bucks? And he said, you can decide that. And I was like, look, just how much do you want to be paid? So we go back and forth about it. Finally, he tells me a number and it's like, fine, I'll pay you that. So I pay him, I go get him my check and I pay him whatever. 
and he leaves. Okay. So then I, today, I was real tired because I lasted last night and didn't think about it until today. Today I was looking at this packet again, just because it's sitting on my desk, right? And the pictures of the house are very blurred. They're very blurry. They're not like their first. I didn't notice this yesterday. And all the other pictures of the interior of the house are all like perfect, pristine pictures. Like he pulled them off the internet or something, right? And it, they don't all match up with his house. Their pictures are like all professional pictures. They're not pictures you would go in and take of your house, right? But he told me he tried to sell that, sell his house before, and he has an a current realtor. And so I figured, well, maybe they, they had professional take these pictures. You know, it's possible. But then I'm looking at the pictures closer, and they don't make sense. So I'll start looking up on the MLS because he said his house was currently listed. Look it up in the MLS. Oh, by the way, and this does not show the address of the house at all. There's no address of the house. It's just the pictures of the house and information about the house, like rooms and stuff like that. And so um, I didn't know how to look it up, right? Because I couldn't find the address. So what I did is I went and looked at all the $3.2 million houses or houses in that range anyway in Fort Worth for sale right now on the MLS or that had sold recently or been on the market recently. This house is not any, anywhere any of those houses, okay? There's lots of houses there, big houses, whatever, but none of them are these photographs. And then I went to the uh, appraisal at Dallas, appraisal, I'm not Dallas, Fort Worth appraisal district uh, thing to look that up to make see if he was telling the truth and look up his name. And yeah, I, found on, I found a house with his name on it, right? And this is public information. Found the house with his name on it, and his name was next to a house that was like a $120,000 house, a very small like you know house or whatever for Dallas standards. Um, or in terms of price, I mean, so I was like, okay, uh, interesting. Maybe it's in his kid's name. So I kept looking and looking, looking, and there is literally no house that's worth $3.2 million in Fort Worth. That's on the tax rolls. So the guy is full of shit. <laughs> so this is the point of the story is why would someone go to all this trouble. Oh, by the way, and he said he would call. I said, when I, he left, I said, so are you serious? You really want me to sell your house for you? He's like, sure. Yeah, I do. I really do. Cause I have to get, I have to tell my other agent that I'm going to hire you instead. And he said, once I tell her, then I'll call you about it. Blah, blah. I said, okay, when you're ready, you just call me. He said, okay. And so why would someone go through all of that crazy, crazy story that he made up? Apparently, maybe he did. Maybe I'm missing something. Maybe it's not what I think. I don't know. But, you know, I've been around long enough to know people are probably fucking, you know, fucking with you. Right. And so he um, hold on. There's a message here. Oh, there it is. And so he um, basically went through this entire story, this entire facade for what reason? What is the purpose of someone doing that? I don't understand it. I don't get it. I mean, he's perfectly nice and I was going to use him again and again. I probably still would, but it makes me, it freaks me out to me. Um, it freaks me out to me that someone would, you know, if he is indeed lying about all this, it would freak me out having someone like that in my house. You know what I mean? It would make me feel very uncomfortable to have someone like that in my home because if you're lying about all this crap and what other things are they lying about and who are they really? And you know, da, 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 da. I even lo looked into his phone number, looked his phone number up and his phone number comes up with this, um, these businesses, um, about hauling people's, uh, hauling people's stuff off or whatever, like hauling or whatever. And so I don't know. And I haven't, I haven't gone into great detail because I don't really care that much about if he's lying or not. I just think it's weird. And, but I don't expect to hear back from this guy at all. I don't expect to hear back from him at all. I don't, I, I think I'll never hear from him again. And I don't think he's ever going to ever admit that he lied, but I just thought it was a very bizarre story and a very bizarre thing for someone to do to come out and actually go through all that to convince me that they were a millionaire. And he said he was going to buy a yacht and live on it when he sold this house because his wife took all his money except the house. And he said his kids didn't want the house because they said they knew what he paid in taxes on it and how much it cost to cool and heat it. So anyway, I don't know what the truth is. I just thought it was a weird story. And I thought, <clears throat> you know, why me? Why I always get these fucking weird people coming to my place. But anyway, that was the plumber story. So, um, Beyond that, I was going to talk about a couple more things. Um, quickly, I want to mention that on Coven, if you're if somebody who watches Coven, 
uh, which is American Horror Story Coven this season, uh, which is about witches, a coven of witches, obviously. Uh, she, Jessica Lange, said today that she's going to be leaving the show after next season. So I guess that means she's going to be on again for one more year, and then after that she's leaving the show. Um, but she's a really huge part of the show. She's kind of the constant thread through every single season. You know, the first season she was the nosy uh, not so crazy neighbor, whatever, who wanted to have a baby really bad. And the second season, she was um, the nun who oversaw the people in the uh, the mental institution. Um, run, and then this season, she's like the supreme witch. She's the biggest, baddest witch of them all, basically. And so I don't know what she'll be. I don't know if they're doing zombies next season or what they're doing next season or vampires or something. But um, anyway, so... It's sad because I really love her and she kind of makes the show. She always has these great one-liners and I really miss her on the show. It'd be fabulous that she stay, if she stays. But anyway, I guess, I guess you know, a lot of times the big time movie actors and actresses sometimes feel like they're slumming it when they're doing TV and she's always been a movie actress. And so I, I, maybe that's part of what it is, but I think it's great. I think it's great. But anyway, so something I was going to talk about was I was noticing that, um, you know, I've noticed this about myself in the past, and I was curious if other people felt the same way about sex. But if you, for me, the more sex I have, the more sex that I want. So, you know, whenever, like when I was single and I would have sex, you know, after like a few weeks or a month or whatever, and I'd have sex with somebody or whatever, I would want sex more, more, like instantly, like, oh my God, I want more, I want more, I want more. <laughs> so I started to crave sex more the more that I had it. And so, um, I don't know if anybody else is like that if it's just me. So does that make me a sex addict if, if I like crave sex, um, after I've had sex, I don't know if it makes me an addict or not, but I wonder if there's something to that because people like, if you think about something else, like if you're, if you have alcohol and then you want more alcohol when you've had alcohol, then doesn't that make you kind of an alcoholic because you want more and more and more and you can't get sated from it or whatever. So maybe I'm like a nymphomaniac or something. <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> but like, I know I'm not, but I'm just saying maybe I'm like really a sexually, very sexual person. <laughs> so I don't know if everybody else was like that. I was just me. Um, but you know, sex is like something people, I, I was thinking about sex today and it's like something people were so uptight about. And I've always been very open about sex and sexuality in general. And I don't know why, because my family was not open about sex, you know, they, it was very, it wasn't like it was like naughty necessarily. It just was not something that they talked about at all. You know, my mom never talked about sex to me or, you know, my family did or anything else. Not really. I mean, um, so it was never really something we talked about. And so, um, I grew up though, very open, sexually open and very liberated sexually and very uninhibited. And I still am. And so, but I'm always surrounded by people who are very sexually repressed or sexually, um, tame or sexually inhibited or something like that. And, and I've dated a lot of men like that. <laughs> and I've dated a lot of men who weren't, I've dated men who were like me and who were very much the other way around the opposite. I mean, so I, I don't know. I just, I think it's weird because I feel very, um, free about it, but I think society in general is very, very, um, judgmental about sex in general. And, and Americans look at sex as a dirty thing and you're supposed to be hidden behind closed doors or whatever. And I'm not saying people should be out in public fucking in front of like the general public or whatever. Of course not. But I'm saying, you know, I mean, why is it like so taboo to see a woman's breasts on a movie or a man's flaccid penis in a movie, you know, what's the big deal about those things? And it seems like those things are changing in terms of the film industry to some degree, because it's becoming more and more typical and rote to see those things. Right. But when it comes to, um, general, the general public, it's like sex is just something it's not supposed to talk about. So I don't know. I'm just like, when I have sex, I always want more of it, whatever. Maybe it's just some sexual being. I don't know. But I've never made any apologies for that. That's who I am. That's what I am. That's what I've always been like. And um, yet I've almost all, you know, I'd say probably the, the serious relationships that I've had, the very serious ones, I've always been, had a very, uh, I'd say sexual disparity um, for a, a lot of them anyway, has been a sexual disparity, meaning where I'm very sexual, they're not sexual or they're very sexual. And well, I'm always sexual. So that was never an issue, <laughs> but um, you know what I mean? So I've had a lot of really intimate relationships that were very long term like that, but I've also had ones where they weren't. So 
I don't know. I think it's an interesting thing. And, you know, is it, is it a deal breaker? I think it can be absolutely. And I think that people need to be on the same page sexually as well as mentally and intellectually and, you know, sense of humor and all sorts of things to really have a relationship that works long term. I think you can't really be in a relationship where any particular aspect of that relationship is only, you know, kind of okay. So that's just what I think. The last thing I was going to talk about was, you know, there are people, um, for, I'm, 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 you know, look, I am not somebody who's afraid to toot his own horn. As you well know, I talk about myself all the time about how wonderful a person I am, <laughs> how great and wonderful and terrific I am and accomplished, whatever. Great. And that's because I am, and I'm, I know who I am and I like who I am. So if you don't like me, fuck you, but this is who I am and I know who I am. And not only through my own eyes, but through the eyes of other people. And so when people, um, you know, have attacked me in the past through my life or whatever. Um, it always cracks me up and always takes me aback when people who are far less accomplished than I am or far less, uh, intelligent than I am or whatever the case may be, attack me and act like I'm somehow not better than they are. And that sounds, I know how that sounds. And, but what I'm trying to say is this, they'll like to attack me and say, you know, well, fuck you, blah, blah, whatever. And, and act like, you know, there's something wrong with me because I'm gay or because I'm biracial or whatever. And I'm like, well, what have you done with your life? You know? <clears throat> and usually when I ask them that question, oftentimes it's nothing. They're either a, you know, I don't know, somebody's never ever done anything real, whether it's professionally or personally. And I think in life you have to take chances. The only way I've always said and thought the only way you get the good stuff in life is to take chances. You can't play your entire life safe and expect to end up some incredibly wonderful place in your life or having accomplished so many wonderful things. You'll end up in a safe place. You'll end up safe and content to some degree, but will you really end up happy? I don't know. Um, I don't think so. And so this is just my way of looking at things. And people obviously have different takes on life and how they live their lives. And that's perfectly fine to have a different take on it. But when you do something in your life and you, you've like, for example, if you want to do something in your life or professionally, personally, whatever, and you don't do it, you're really hurting only yourself. And so I have always done everything that I've wanted to do except one thing. And I still regret that one thing. I've talked about this before on my show and that's going to New York and to, or to LA or whatever when I was younger and pursuing some, um, some creative uh, endeavors I wanted to pursue at the time when I was a teenager. But beyond that, I've done every single thing I've ever wanted to do. If I wanted to do something, wanted to accomplish something, I go after it. I, I, <clears throat> I try to accomplish it. If I fail, so what? I fucking fail. If I succeed, wonderful. But half the time you're going to succeed to some degree. And so I always say it's better not to say, what if it's better to say I tried. And I, so I always try. And so that's the only reason that I'm, um, I consider myself to have been accomplished, not because of the things I have or what I do, but necessarily, but because I have tried, I try I continue to try, even when I don't want to try anymore. I fucking try and try and try and try. It's like something built into me, like a fucking Energizer bunny. I can't not try. I can't not hope. I can't not continue to move forward and, and to look to, over the horizon for something even grander. So because I'm like that, I've accomplished a great deal, I feel. And so and I, everybody's idea of accomplishment is different. Your idea may be having someone to love you and having a, a loving relationship. Someone else's idea may be material things, you know, like cars and houses and shit like that. Someone else may be to have friends or, or someone else may be to be artistic or have a great career, whatever your, whatever your, your dream is that you want to accomplish in your life. You have to try to do it. And I have to say one more thing. And I know somebody in particular is listening right now. And I don't want you to think this is just about you, by the way, this is about people in general. Um, you have to, in my opinion, you have to really live your life for yourself. You can't live it for anybody else. And, um, I find it to be a mistake to live your life in concert with someone, someone else's wishes and not your own. 
because your life is in your hands. And of course, it is your choice, whomever you are, whatever choices you make, it is your choice to make. It is your choice to live one way or the other. But you can't go back on looking back on your life thinking, what if, like I had to do, because I didn't take the chances I did one time in my life when I had the opportunity when I was young. Um, you can't look back on your life and say, what if, and blame anybody else but yourself. So I just fear for myself or for my family, my friends, whomever. And I have plenty of friends, you know, not just you. I know you, you know you're listening, but not just you. But I mean, I have plenty of friends who have done the same thing in their lives and they have made, really put other people ahead of themselves. And they almost, almost inevitably, always, almost inevitably end up sad, lonely people or unhappy at least because they put someone else's life ahead of their own. They made someone else's pri life a priority instead of their own life. It is not, it is not ever the right choice. In my opinion, this is my show. So I'm giving my opinion. It is never right in my choice, in my opinion, to ever put someone else's needs ahead of your own. If it means, uh, it's your own to your own detriment. So if you can put someone else's needs above yourself, you know, like for example, if you can loan somebody, you know, a five thousand dollars, and you're not going to miss the money, it's not going to hurt you, whatever, then by, by God, do it. But don't loan somebody five thousand dollars when you can't fucking pay your mortgage or your car payment or your your utility bill or you pay buy groceries or something. You know what I mean? And and don't put someone else's needs in front of your own if you yourself are not living the life that you want to live already. So if you're living a life that's filled and full and everything else, and you can do that for someone, great. Like I'm doing for my mom because I love her and I can, I can do for, I can afford to do it. I can, and I want to do it and I love her and it's, we have a good relationship, good enough relationship, you know, that we can live, you know, in the same, on the same property and not kill each other. And that's because I want to do it, but I, did it cause me great hardship to do it? No, it didn't. So that's the difference. So anyway, I just wanted to say that. So that's pretty much all I wanted to say tonight. Not really much I wanted to say besides that. And you need to also look out for the crew, uh, show, which is going to, which is with me and, uh, David from the five by five show and Kim Boggle from Kim Boggle show on BTR. Um, we're going to be doing a show called the crew coming up soon. If I ever do my part, which I'll be doing after this show actually, um, and sending to David, um, I'm going to be doing, we're going to be doing a show where we talk about different topics from a gay perspective and three different gay perspectives. Cause we're three pretty different people. David is David, Ken's Ken and I'm me. And so, um, I'm not sure if you're talking about the view as opposed to the crew. Um, David would probably be Whoopi Goldberg. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe Whoopi Goldberg. I think Ken Boggle would be Elizabeth Hasselbeck and maybe I would be Barbara Walters. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know who I would be actually, but anyway, maybe more like Joy Boy. I think I'd probably be more like Joy Behar. I'd, be, I'd probably Joy Behar. Yes. Joy, even though she's not there anymore, but I probably would be Joy Behar. David would be Whoopi Goldberg, I think. And, um, Ken would be uh, Elizabeth Hasselbeck. So there, that way you have an idea of the different kind of perspectives you're going to get on things uh, on the crew show. So um, you'll know you'll be getting very different perspectives on the same topic. So they're fun topics, different topics. I think the first topic we're talking about is what Halloween character you would want to get a bed with if you had the choice, <clears throat> um, like, you know, vampires or, or I don't know, whatever fucking other ones there are. But anyway, so check that out. It's coming up soon on Spreaker.com. And um, you can also type in the crew and you can also follow that show so that when it does happen, you'll get an email alert that we're uh, having the first show. So uh, the shows are not live, but they are uh, pre-recorded, but they're still fun to listen to. So, and they're short and I think they're only like 20 minutes long or so. So check that out. So thanks for listening to the show, everybody. I appreciate you coming by and I want to um, say everybody have a great night and a great day and live your dreams and be you. I'll see you later. Good night.